And now we come to Reflecting Contemporary 12th Century Politics and Society in the Historia. A careful reader of the Historia will find that Joffrey integrated 12th century politics, culture, and society into his chronicle. The beginning turbulence of the anarchy and civil war especially have parallels within his chronicle as do certain traits of the Norman court that appears in the courts of Arthur and other kings and questions about legitimate queenship. Thanks to the vast amount of invented historical material found in the Historia, there are plenty of opportunities for Joffrey to incorporate 12th century themes this is most likely one reason why Joffrey wrote in the chronicle style. A medieval chronicle focused on a year-by-year -year account of the actions of kings and princes, as well as the events that take place as those years unfolded. Histories, on the other hand, were more like biographies, focusing on one single figure and the events of their life. Historians also were composed of elegant language, while chroniclers were meant to be much simpler in their writing. However, Joffrey's use of the language changes depending on the state of Britain in the Historia, as seen in his descriptions of civil upheaval. Joffrey's chronicle eventually led to a renewed interest in not only Arthur, but also in the history of the ancient Celtic kings. As Andrew Galloway notes, Joffrey's work managed to provoke earnest historical writing involving intensive comparison, inquiry, and intercalation with other works. Joffrey's Historia became a major influence for the many vernacular translations from his Chronicles original Latin as well as future writers of ancient Britain history, and the political themes he included played a major role in this influence. Joffrey went to great lengths to make his Historia appear to be a true history. While there were contemporary scholars of the time who denounced Joffrey's Chronicle, the most well-known example being William of Newburgh, Joffrey constructed the Historia to appear as a legitimate chronicle, the clearest and first sign of historical legitimization is Joffrey's use of Latin. As Joffrey was a cleric, it is no surprise that he wrote the Historia in Latin, the universal language of the church in the 12th century, but also the language used in official documents, as well as some written storytelling. Joffrey also legitimizes his work by citing his own multilingualism and an obscure written source, claiming that the Oxford Archdeacon Walter, which he went about translating into Latin for the sake of his Historia, gave him a certain very ancient book in the British language. The mention of such a source and an Oxford authority condoning it would have been meaningful for Joffrey's noble audience. Not only does he cite a legitimate, although unverifiable, source for his chronicle, he shows that he is a learned man who can comprehend multiple ancient languages and can move in between them. Joffrey also frequently refers to Gildas and Bede, historians who covered similar periods of history to the one that the Historia recounts. Joffrey makes sure to mention that he is the first to focus on the ancient Britain kings, though establishing himself as the gatekeeper of their specific history. At the end of the Historia, 
he cements his status as their sole historian by asking that all be silent in regard to the kings of the Britons. Since they do not have that book in the British tongue, which Walter the Archdeacon of Oxford obtained from Wales, Joffrey's request is an unexpected one, going so far as to address directly other chroniclers who would have likely had no desire to write on the ancient kings of Britain. Indeed, the subject matter of the Historia was one that was largely unexplored by historians and chroniclers. The history of the ancient Britons, called the Welsh by Joffrey's period, did not have their own history, while the French, Normans, and Saxons had all been significantly documented. The Welsh were certainly not seen as heirs to the Great Isle, as they were considered a barbarous people in 12th century Britain. Joffrey himself states that the Welsh name could be derived from their own barbarity, and the term Welsh is a descendant of the Anglo-Saxon word for slave. Joffrey's medieval intellectual claim is made stranger by the fact that similar remarks were almost unparalleled in medieval historians. This unusual request can also be interpreted as politically motivated. Joffrey expertly secures himself a platform from which to espouse his own political rhetoric, a platform which no other historian or chronicler can use to interject his own views. Joffrey wanted the narrative of his historia and the politics involved in it to have only one representative voice, his own. Despite the ancient setting of Joffrey's history, much of what he depicts resembles the Norman courts of the 12th century, the court culture with which Joffrey would have been familiar. Imperialism and semblances to the Norman court are seen throughout his history, even though his account ends a few centuries before William the Conqueror came to Britain. Conquest presented both positively and negatively by Joffrey is one of the major actions of the Historia. The greatest kings, particularly Arthur, expand Britain through conquest, which acted as a standard to show how well a king rules his kingdom. If the king has time to conquer foreign powers, as Arthur nearly does to Rome, then the Britain state is experiencing a period of civil tranquility. This positive connection to conquest would have resonated with Norman audiences. The Norman conquest was what established Norman culture in Britain, and imperial expansion would have been an important facet of the Anglo-Norman identity. Joffrey utilized aspects of Norman court culture to portray advanced Britain civilization in the Historia, establishing a link between contemporary Norman power and the heroes of his chronicle. This understanding helps justify why the courts of the ancient Britons in Joffrey's Historia, especially Arthur's, resemble the Norman courts, specifically in the way that Britain kings conducted their courts. For example, J.S.P. Tadlock noticed how the court is constantly on the move, both in the Historia and in history. It is desirable to live first on one estate and then on another. Considering the state of his kingdom, it is no surprise that Stephen's court moved frequently. In the Historia, such a practice is seen when Arthur, after much deliberation, decides to host the Feast of Pentecost in the city of Caerleon, a proto-Camelot. King Arthur's court was also an international marvel, with emphasis on feasting, feasting, 
tournaments, and chivalry. Joffrey claimed that under Arthur's rule, Britain surpassed all other kingdoms in its courtliness, where knights bettered themselves for the affections of women, and women were purer in their love for men. The knight's betterment usually takes place in mock battles during tournaments, a practice that thrived under Stephen's reign and saw its development from military training to entertainment in the 12th century. A knight proving his worth through tournaments is a trademark of courtly romance and an important part of the Arthurian tradition. While these elements are not a central focus on Joffrey's Historia, its themes of knightly strength and dignified courtly behavior proved wildly popular with the Norman nobles. The aristocratic culture arising in the 12th century was based on displays of wealth and finery, and Arthur's court displays luxury regularly such as feasts served by 1,000 young men clad in ermine. Arthur's court was not only a reflection of this rising court culture, but depicted an ideal court of extravagance, a court so far ahead of its time that its members lived in a chivalric utopia. Joffrey's Arthur began the tradition of seeing the medieval court as a romantic culture in both literature and reality, even though the modes of noble power, in particular, possessing land, wealth, and military prowess did not change. In addition, thanks to the work such as Joffrey's, a perception of history began to emerge in the 1140s that the Normans and Anglo-Saxons shared common ancestors. In the same way that Joffrey's ancient Britain people had a natural-born right to Britain in the Historia, the Normans were beginning to associate themselves with an Anglo-Saxon past and a right to the Great Isle as well. It is also worth mentioning that the courts of the Britain kings bear no resemblance to the courts of 12th century Wales, the descendants of the historical ancient Britain kings. It would have made more historical sense to incorporate the traditions of the Welsh into the court of Arthur and the other kings, yet Joffrey obviously wanted there to be a Norman connection between his constructed history and his contemporary time. The Norman influence certainly would have helped ground Norman readers within the narrative of the Historia's fictional events, as well as draw the political parallels between the ancient Britons and current Anglo-Norman rulers. No matter his reasons, the Norman influence certainly would have helped ground Norman readers within the narrative of the Historia's fictional events, as well as draw the political parallels between the ancient Britons and current Anglo-Norman rulers. No matter his reasons, using the Normans as a model undoubtedly contributed to the Historia's popularity. Another contemporary political issue that arises within the Historia is the legitimacy of queenship, specifically if not explicitly, Matilda's. According to Joffrey, natural law is one of the most important factors in choosing a ruler and is a necessity if Britain will remain unified under a given king's rule. With Joffrey's constant reminders that disregarding the natural laws of succession will only bring discord to Britain, the Historia can be seen not only as a warning against civil war, but also a call of support for Matilda. Matilda was the legal heir of Henry I, a ruling that King Stephen openly disobeyed when he took the throne. One of the reasons that Stephen was able to take power was because the idea of a female ruler was 
was difficult to accept for many of the nobility. Joffrey never directly addresses Matilda in his Historia, despite both her connection to his patron, Robert of Gloucester, and her political presence at the time of Historia's completion, probably because Stephen was king during the composition and publication of the Historia. In fact, Joffrey praised Stephen and his rule in the Historia's dedication, although this message to Stephen survives in only one manuscript, the Burn Manuscript. The only other individual addressed in the dedication is Robert of Gloucester. Robert was Joffrey's patron, so dedicating the work to him over Matilda was expected. Further, appealing to Robert over Matilda was not a specific case. Since Matilda was rarely considered an influential political figure in the conflict over her own throne, and other chroniclers tended to write more about her brother Robert than her, this tendency arises despite the fact that Matilda had a head for military tactics and leadership, as displayed by her capture of Lincoln Castle in 1141. Even if Joffrey decided to write to Matilda, Robert was the safer and more sanctioned choice at the time. While he did not explicitly name her, Joffrey did support Matilda's rule through his chronicle. Despite what Joffrey's contemporaries may have thought about a woman as ruler, Joffrey made sure to include several queens in his Historia. While one can hardly consider the Historia a feminist text, the inclusion of legitimate female rulers signal that Joffrey is compiling a case for Matilda within his history. Joffrey went out of his way to set an example for powerful queenship, recounting many queens in his Historia who rule well and alone. Women rulers were usually and rarely seen in the recorded early history of the British, French, or Welsh. Indeed, as J.S.P. Tadlock notes, there was little true historical precedent for Joffrey's many ancient Britain queens. A well-known example would be that of Cordelia, King Lear's third and most loved daughter. Joffrey's story differs from its Shakespearean counterpart, the major deviation being that Lear reclaims his power after being outed by his two oldest daughters, and Cordelia rules Britain well for 15 years after him. Cordelia still meets a tragic end when her nephews overthrow her peaceful rule through civil war. Heartbroken after losing her kingdom, the queen commits suicide. As Fiona Tolhurst notes, there is an interesting parallel between the stories of Cordelia and Matilda. Both have their thrones taken away from them by male relatives, and their thrones usurped because the key political players were outraged that Britain was now subject to a woman, while Stephen and his cohorts probably were not as explicit about this belief as Cordelia's nephews. Resistance to the idea of a woman ruler enabled Stephen's ascent to power. While there are other queens of Joffrey's Historia, some who rule well and others who even raise armies to take the throne by force, Cordelia's unfortunate circumstances are the most like the resistance Matilda faced in Joffrey's contemporary Britain. The main political theme of the Historia is civil war and Joffrey frequently uses episodes of his history to criticize civil division and those that cause it. Considering that the Historia was written before the main activity of the anarchy which started in 1139, Joffrey was more than likely imagining scenarios of violence that could arise if a war over the crown became a reality. Conquest, especially, is written about often, and it is described either positively or negatively depending on the historical moment. Positive conquest is when Britain is united 
prospering, and militarily superior. Belinus and Brennius are such an example when Brennius submits to his brother, the rightful king. It creates a British kingdom powerful enough to subjugate the Roman Empire. Positive conquest typically appears in the standard chronicle style, with an impersonal report as we see in the account of Belinus and Brennius conquering Rome, which the recount without embellishment up until the siege of Rome itself. One excerpt from the brothers' story tells the Romans therefore resolve to come out of the city and meet the enemies on the field of battle. Just then, even as they were arranging their battalions more effectively, the consuls arrived ahead of schedule. The important thing to remember is that this is a siege of the city of Rome, which would have been a momentous historical victory for the Britons if this event had actually occurred. Joffrey describes the siege with the aplomb of an objective transcriber, detailing the events of the battle in a meticulous style that makes the siege more like a business meeting than a conquest. This is the way a chronicler should write, and the reader sees the style in the positive moments of the Historia. It is when there is civil discord that the reader sees Joffrey's diction and style take a more artful and darker turn. There are other episodes within the Historia that describe violence and battle to nightmarish extremes. These are the examples of negative conquest. One passage details the reign of Coreticus, who was a lover of civil wars. His rules and balance brings for an invasion from a king of Africa, Gormand, who eventually laid waste to the entire island of Britain. His fury did not cease until he had ravaged almost the entire surface of the island from sea to sea. Joffrey uses apocalyptic language to depict the violence that results from civil war, creating an intensity that is absent from episodes displaying British military supremacy and British unity. Another aspect of civil war within the Historia is that it often goes hand in hand with the betrayal of relatives, their kin causing chaos, betray both Lear and Arthur, other kings such as Lacrinus, betray their wives through adultery and as a result cause crisis in succession. Civil war almost always occurs as a consequence of familial betrayal, drawing a distinct parallel between the events of the Historia and current events in Joffrey's own Anglo-Norman Britain. One of the starkest examples of betrayal in the Historia, combining both the political and the familial, that has remained constant throughout the entirety of the Arthurian tradition after Joffrey, is Mordred betraying his uncle, King Arthur. In the Historia, Arthur entrusts Mordred with his kingdom, while Arthur goes to confront the Roman force that attempts to subjugate Britain. Arthur defeats the Roman army and moves on to conquer other nations, setting his sights on Rome. This campaign signifies Arthur's unified rule that allows for positive conquest. His campaign is interrupted before he takes Rome by news of Mordred acting as a tyrant and a traitor. Arthur returns to his kingdom to fight Mordred, with both falling in their final battle along with their supporters, a battle that Joffrey describes as a great carnage. Knowing the origins of the anarchy, it is hard not to see a comparison between Mordred and Stephen of Blois. Both are related to the king as a nephew, both are entrusted with a command, and both betray this command when the king leaves. Further cementing that Mordred is an interpretation of Stephen is a message written by Joffrey to Robert, Earl of Gloucester. After introducing Mordred's betrayal of Arthur in the Historia, Joffrey directly addresses Robert, reminding the Earl 
that he is only relating what he found in the above-mentioned source in the British tongue. This is the only time that Joffrey addresses Robert other than in the Historia's dedication and ending. Joffrey makes an appeal to Robert here because he realizes the parallel that is about to be drawn as Arthur and his nephew go to war. Joffrey wants to alert his patron that what Robert is about to read has contemporary significance. J.S.P. Tatlock remarks on Joffrey's message to Robert in his writing, stating, Therefore, to Matilda's chief supporter, Robert, Joffrey would seem, with equal emphasis and caution, to hint an analogy and his own sympathies. This small message to Robert can be read as Joffrey's secret confession of allegiance to Matilda. Joffrey's original depiction of Arthur's final days and Mordred would be changed in later adaptions of the Arthurian legend, with Guinevere and Lancelot's affair playing a much larger role in Mordred's schemes. However, Mordred's betrayal remains a fixed point in the Arthurian mythos as the character responsible for ending Arthur's reign. Joffrey's interest in Norman customs, his efforts to legitimize queenship, and his condemnations of civil strife show the political motivations he had for writing his chronicle. There is evidence to suggest other motives as well, of course, Joffrey's insistence that no other histories of the ancient Britain kings existed was a true one. The Historia was produced in a time of rapid historical documentation, which became dominant after the Norman Conquest. Joffrey may have been motivated by a desire for personal glory as the first chronicler of a previously unexplored historical period. If this were his ambition, it might help explain Joffrey's request at the end of the Historia that other chroniclers leave the history of the Briton kings only to him. There is also the matter of Joffrey's Welsh heritage. He may have felt a personal connection to this historical subject, despite his negative descriptions of the Welsh as a barbarous people. While these motivations are all valid, there are too many reminders of 12th century politics to disbelieve that Joffrey had a political agenda for his Historia. Yet Joffrey's Historia is not known for its status as a political text, but as the origin point of significant British literary works especially the extensive literary tradition of King Arthur. As there is a clear link between the Historia and Arthur, then one can assume that the politics of Joffrey's Chronicle had a part to play in beginning the legendary king's literary tradition. Song.